get a uh... Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Carl Frank, president of AI Financial. We've got a small group here today in the office, and we've got uh, a couple dozen, I think, online. So it's great to uh, see you all. I'm imagining looking through the camera, seeing your smiling faces. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen each other in person. So please come into the office. We're enjoying our time together here today. That's where we're a few minutes late. We've got this new technology. We're really excited to try it out. Um, on the call already, we've got our speaker live from London. Uh, I just want to spend a, a minute or two and remind us what we're here to talk about. We're talking about international investing. Uh, many of you, in fact, everybody I think in the room has money invested with uh, Andrew Goodwin, who is our speaker today. So uh, I think you'll find a, a great interest in that. Um, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to allow Mike Pasito from I Am Global Partners. I Am Global Partners, as you may recall, uh, is the firm we use to make many of our investment decisions. And uh, they've been a key research partner of ours for almost 30 years now. And we've known Mike not quite that long. Uh, but we've been good friends and, and had a great professional relationship for more than a decade and maybe longer than that, Mike, I don't really want to give our ages away, but it's been a long time. So uh, I'm going to allow Mike to introduce our speaker. For questions, please use the chat menu. You can type those chat menu questions in any time during the presentation, and we'll address those at the end. Uh, we are recording this, so if you have any friends who might be interested, we'll send you the Zoom link, and then you can, uh, it'll be a YouTube link by the time you get it and you can share the video with them. So without further ado, uh, Mike, please take it away. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Carl. And uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to make this my part really snappy because I think what you really want to do is listen to what Andrew has to say. Um, so Andrew is a portfolio manager and partner at, at Oldfield Partners. And for those of you who don't know, know who Oldfield Partners is, which would probably be the, the vast majority of you, you could say that Richard Oldfield, the founder of the, of the firm, is kind of reminiscent of a, uh, a Warren Buffett type of personality, maybe not to that kind of scale, but very well-known and renowned investor in the UK. And so we couldn't think of anyone better to speak to everyone today than Andrew. Um, and Andrew is, uh, as I said, a portfolio manager there. He's been there since 2013. With everything that's happening you know, from the geopolitical side, from the macroeconomic side across the world, um, this is an amazing time. Uh, really incredible opportunities have made themselves available to investors internationally outside the United States. So the value of having a real true professional who has a lot of acumen and experience in the international space at the helm of the investment portfolio that you have outside of the U.S. is really important. So we're going to go through, um, Andrew's going to go through how he does it, what he's doing, stocks that he likes, and then taking a Q&A. And then in terms of providing some color, Kiko Vallarta from the IM Global Partner, he is the head of international equities. So um, I guess you could say, Andrew, you'll be doing the play-by-play -play, and then Kiko, you might jump in with some color. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn the slides and hand the baton to you, Andrew. Great, thank you, Mike. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. And as they said, I'm live from London, uh, which is where we're based at Oldfield Partners. And, um, we mentioned Richard Oldfield, which was the founder of our business. And he wrote a book uh, many years ago now called Simple But Not Easy. And I want you to keep that in mind as I talk through how we do things uh, and what's special about what we do and about Oldfield Partners. So perhaps, Mike, if we turn to the, the first slide in our booklet, there's a lot on here. But what I probably want to do is just pick up some of the key points that I want to bring across. So firstly, we're contrarian value investors. And I'm going to go into what value means for us and why we think it's important to be a value investor, particularly in these markets. Uh, another key point is conviction, that we run a focused portfolio, which really is made up of the best ideas that we can find from the international equity markets. And that's what we really drill down to and focus upon. And the next is really the preservation of capital. And on the right hand side of this slide, we talk, we talk about things like margin of safety, we're cautious about leverage and risk adjusted outcomes. But really what it means is we're aligned uh, with our client base, that we also are investors in our own funds. And we view risk differently to what we think of as the benchmark risk, which a lot of institutional investors look at that's being different to a benchmark. For us, Risk is the permanent loss of capital, and that's what we have a complete aversion to, and that's what we spend a lot of our time trying to avoid and doing our work to try and avoid that, looking for the margins of safety 
uh, is a key component. But we need to be patient and we're unconstrained. We don't follow that benchmark. So if we turn to the next slide, Mike, what this shows is on the right hand side in that graph is value versus growth over time. Uh, and what this shows is from the 70s up until sort of 2008, value worked hands down uh, in beating growth. And value is, is a style of investment that we follow. So when value does well, we do very well. Uh, that's something very important to keep in mind. Now, this chart can go right back with 150 years of empirical data that shows the same thing, that value investing throughout time is the way it's worked uh, to generate long-term capital appreciation. It's been the best way to do it. But what you should also note from this chart is that that hasn't really worked uh, in the financial crisis, where we had the Federal Reserve and central banks around the world creating liquidity in the form of quantitative easing. And what that happened was it was a headwind for value investing and growth really took off. And that sort of culminated in 2021, 2020. And, you know, if you cast your minds back then, we were talking about things like SPACs. It was a lot of sort of concept stocks, ARK Innovation. Uh, I don't know if you've came across that as, as roaring ahead. And that to us was clear signs of speculation and exuberance. And that's something we want to stand outside of that. Again, it's that loss of money. The price we pay for things is incredibly important to us. And we're very careful about committing capital. And what we, we think now is, as Mike was outlining, that now is absolutely the right time to be a value investor and it's starting to come really through and and also it's those international markets where value is, is has the greatest opportunity so if we turn to the next slide this again is showing it's showing the msci efi value and msci efi growth and you'll see the light blue line is outperforming this shows again that this, this international that value has been the place to be to generate those long-term capital returns and uh and, and so that's why we want to be value investors but as richard said in his book it sounds simple but it's certainly not easy so if we turn to the next slide uh mike and why it's why it's not easy is there are points when value struggles and what this, the dark part of the chart shows is this value doing well, that value is outperforming. But you'll see, particularly in sort of 2000, uh, the light blue line, which is growth outperforming. And that's when we had the 1999 to 2000 sort of TMT bubble, TMT mania. And typically value finds it difficult to keep up with that in that environment. And what again you'll see is, post the financial crisis, that value has been a tough place to be, uh, that you've had these concept stocks, you've had growth, and that's where the money has been pushed more and more into. Uh, and what we do is stay steadfastly in, with the value discipline. We're looking at assets, we're looking at cash flows, and we're looking at the price we pay for that as one of the key determinants of the return going forward. And we certainly want to avoid overpaying for things because that's where we feel capital can be permanently destroyed as perhaps we saw in 2021 in particular. And what you'll also see here is it's starting to really come back uh, in spades. Now, this turn to value. So if we turn to the next slide, this is the performance so far with the strategy. And, and you'll see it's working, that we are starting to deliver this outperformance because we we really feel that this environment now is moving in our favour and that we're set fair to deliver those long-term capital returns from, it, from the international equity markets uh, and that this sort of outperformance will continue. And it's the next slide, really, that we're sort of talking about the environment uh, and why we think that's the case. And perhaps why, as U.S. investors, you absolutely should be looking at international equities. What we show here is the price to book of the U.S. market versus some international markets, Europe, Japan and the U.K. So that the U.S. is the grey line at the top. And what you can see is not only is it high 
relative to where it's been in history. And what you'll, you'll see is a coincidence to that sort of 99, 2000 level. We got back up to those levels of the TMT bubble. But it's just not the case for the international equity markets. And so you've had this clear separation of valuations with the rest of the world with international equities. And with international equities, they remain pretty similar to levels that they were 10 years ago on a price to book basis. Now, you can actually pick any of the different valuation multiples and you'll see a similar picture. Now, what's also interesting with this chart is if you take just the value parts of the of the US and international equities, it's a very similar picture. So it's not just that you've had these great technology stocks in the US that have driven valuations. It's a market phenomenon that also goes through the value part of the of the indices. So value in the US is a lot more expensive than value in the international markets. Now, we see this on the stock basis. You know, you know there's no more commodity than, say, an oil company. An oil company in the US typically trades at double the multiples of an oil company anywhere else in the world. And these are global businesses. You know, they've got their oil fields all over the world. Uh, typically, they can be partners in many of the, these cases. And they're selling a commodity product with a global price. Yet you pay double because of that stock is located in the US. And this, this talks to a phenomenon that's been, been ongoing with this US getting pricier and pricier and the rest of the international market, international equities being left behind. And one start that recently hit was that Apple is now valued more than the whole of the UK, which may be a terrible indictment on the UK, but the UK is the third largest stock market in the world. Yeah, Apple is valued more than that. With all the diverse companies, all the IP that the UK has to offer, well, Apple is valued more by the current stock market. If we turn to the next slide, this is not just us saying this. This is analytical um, research from a, a company called Research Affiliates. Now, what they highlight here is the prospective returns over the next 10 years on an annualized basis. And what we've highlighted in, the, in that sort of shaded area is EFI value, which is where we're hunting. Now, when this asset class does well, we do very well for our investors. And what they're saying from here on in, in this, in this area, that you're looking at around a 10% annualized real return going forward for the next 10 years on an annual basis. What your eyes should be drawn to as well is the green dot on the bottom, which is US large growth where they're looking at basically a 0% return uh, in, real, in real terms. So we're hunting in those areas, and we think those valuation differentials mean that we will deliver a far superior long-term capital appreciation from international equities than these other areas and these other markets that are highlighted here. If we turn to the next slide, this shows you our portfolio on the right hand side and the benchmarks for the MSCI EFI and the MSCI EFI value. Uh, and a lot of investors view risk. This is the first point, one of, one of the points I was making earlier on. They view being different to the benchmark as risk. We, we don't. We actually embrace that and view that as opportunity because if you're going to deliver superior returns to a benchmark, then you, by definition, you need to be different. And we focus in on our best ideas. We don't just own stocks because they're big. They, we have an, this real sort of view of the return that stock will deliver and our view of the intrinsic worth or the, the fair value, if you like, of that investment before we make it and at the outset. So everything we do, we have a clear target valuation. And what that means is when you look at some of the valuations at the bottom is we have a, a far cheaper portfolio uh, than the index. And we think that's a great starting point because if you've got low valuations and low expectations for investments, then you can surprise and you have a, a chance to deliver real superior returns. Whereas if everything everyone owns something, it's big in the index, everyone knows it, that that isn't a great recipe for success going forward. And so we, we follow the, what we see is a really differentiated approach with high active share and and high expected returns if we turn to the next slide 
this this is showing you some of the investments uh, that we've made and some of the some of the so what I'm going to do now is drill a bit into the investments and into the portfolio. So you can see last year MHI, uh, which which I'm going to go into talk in more detail, was our best performer, and BT and EasyJet, the airline, was one of our worst last year. If you look at the year to date this year, EasyJet and BT are some of our best performers. And this is very often the case. So we want to be hunting in areas where other investors aren't, where they're out of favor. So airlines in, in, in the onset of COVID. And very often that's where we get the return. But let me try and bring this alive with, a, with an example, a, a stock example from Japan on the next slide. So MHI actually stands for Mitsubishi Heavy Industrial. So when we bought this, it was a, a very unfashionable, we were, we were hunting in Japan for an industrial. And this was a very unfashionable area. It also did things that were unfashionable. So it made power stations, nuclear and gas turbines. It was also in the defense industry. And it was also a jet uh, maker and a fighter jet maker. So these were all incredibly unfashionable. They got hit with COVID. The airline, you know, the airline didn't need new aeroplanes. It was Japan, Japan Japanese. And the stock got very, very cheap. As you see here in the investment thesis, it had a valuation of about $8 billion for a company that was generating $38 billion in sales. And what we liked about this is it actually had some great positions. So when you look at these international equities, you can pick up some of these great companies. So GE in the in the power business is a big competitor of MHI, but MHI actually has better tech and it's a leader in large gas turbines. It's also a leader in nuclear power stations and it's the largest defense contractor in Japan. Uh, now, we didn't know there was going to be this war in Ukraine, Ukraine at the time of purchase, but this absolutely plays into some of the key businesses of MHI. But what we saw, saw here was a business that was being transformed by the management, had a strong balance sheet, so we had a great margin of safety with very low financial leverage. And it had a lot of recurring revenue, uh, which we like. You know, we like assets, we like cash flow, we like safe businesses when we're committing capital to them. And the energy business has a service book. So it, it generates income every year from servicing. It's, every time it sells a gas turbine, it, attached to that is 10 years worth of service revenue. So we saw this improving fundamentals. And now what's happened last year with the suddenly it becomes incredibly fashionable not least because a lot of its businesses play into the net zero environmental side. So it does carbon capture, as mentioned, it does nuclear, which has had a renaissance in Japan and now and now internationally around the world. Uh, but it's a key part of the net zero move uh, as well. So and then the defense side uh, becomes incredible incredibly important. So what you find is when you're looking for these companies, which we do, we're scouring the globe, looking in these areas where perhaps other investors just aren't there, just aren't looking. When sentiment in the market turns, you can really powerful returns can be generated. So last year, this was a share price that was up over 100% in a market that was struggling. Uh, so that shows you the power of going where other investors aren't and what bargains you can find in these international markets, which are just sat there waiting for to be discovered. And then the share prices pop and fly. Actually, fly is quite a good word because the next slide I've got, Mike, if we turn to that, is EasyJet. So EasyJet is, is a leading European airline. Now, given the COVID uh, pandemic, the hardest hit industry was, was perhaps the airline industry, clearly with everything grounded. No one was flying. It was an industry thrown into chaos. Now, we didn't own a single airline share prior to this. And it's an industry that a lot of investors shun because it's it can be very cyclical. It's clearly very capital intensive. And there's often very often overcapacity. But we had our eye on EasyJet. It's a low cost carrier, similar to the sort of the Southwest business model. And we think that gives it lots of advantages. So pre-COVID, this was generating very high returns on capital. Uh, and what we see in COVID is that all of its competitors have become hamstrung. They've, they've really, the balance sheet has been shot to pieces. They've got lots of debts. They've got to reduce capacity and they've had their costs 
go through the roof, uh, not least with the oil price, but also with the unions and the inflation we're seeing. Heavily unionized airlines are having to push through very high wage increases and push up their prices. So the low cost carrier, though, is a superior business model through downturns. It takes market share. It actually comes out of downturns stronger. And we're seeing that now they're investing in new fleets, which makes them even more competitive, lower cost. Uh, uh, and they've got a really strong balance sheet to do that. So we, we think and, and they're also taking costs out in that in that process. So we've got a great margin of safety with the balance sheet and cost base, which gave us that sort of that, that view that we could, even though investors were leaving this sector, that a bargain was now here. And the chart on the right shows the, the value we were paying for the capital, that the whole airline fleet, if you like. And it had fallen from around two and a half times to less than half. Uh, so we think that's a great potential. So even though... We were buying it in this sort of distressed environment. We like that. We think that's the right thing to be doing for long-term capital appreciation. And as the recovery started to come through, as the COVID restrictions have eased, the fundamentals are getting better, and it's already up 45% from this year. And we think there's a long way to go uh, from this. So that's, that's a characteristic of how we operate, that we want to be going where other investors aren't, and that's where we think there's bargains to be had. So if we turn to the next slide, what this shows you is we actually have quite low portfolio turnover. We're, we're, as I said, we're very careful about committing capital to names. And so we're scouring the globe for these ideas. But when we find one, then we absolutely want to move. And we have a watch list of about 30 names where we're constantly watching, waiting for perhaps the right price level before we buy. And Henkel's one just to highlight, again, with the sell-off in Germany last year with the invasion of Ukraine, Germany became almost a pariah as a market. Uh, and the DAX actually fell, the German index, fell to level like a 30-year low valuation level. Now, clearly, there's lots of concerns because they were relying on Russian gas. 40% of their supplies of gas actually came from Russia. And so there was this just capital flight out of Germany. We want to head in the other direction. We want to see if any bargains have been unearthed. And if we turn to the next slide, Mike, what this shows is Henkel, which is a really high quality company. Uh, you can see here on the valuation point, the price to book fell from around three and a half times, which is a pricey level, but it's, it's justified for this company to close to one times price to book. That gives you an idea of how 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 it's fallen. Now, what Henkel does, one of its great businesses, is adhesives. Uh, so it's a small cost for all of the industrial uses, industrial adhesives. They go into everything from cars, and their usage is growing, uh, but it goes into all manner of things. But it's a very small cost, but it's a key component. Like if you go for a cheaper adhesive and it fails, then you've got serious problems. But it gives it great pricing power in this environment, but there's a delay in that price pass through. And so we've seen margins move down. It's low, it's doing lower profits today, but it has a pathway to grow those profits, which you can see we've taken a slide from their own sort of corporate um, literature to show their ambitions to create that, that, that improvement in profitability. But then we get this great opportunity to buy it. And part of that is that whole fear around Germany, whereas we go in and, and, and buy that. So on the next slide, this is the whole portfolio that you can see. And, and again, what this should highlight is a real focus that we have on our best ideas. We have a complete range of different businesses across sectors, uh, but each stock has its own sort of investment thesis and our view of fair value, why we own it and, and why we think this is going to deliver great returns. And we construct the portfolio of these names aiming at diversification and the weights are delivered by the reward we see in terms of the upside, but also the risks around it. So we will position based on the risk rewards to create the portfolio, which on a, and then this is on a two year view using quite conservative estimates, using conservative valuation multiples. We're looking over, over a 50% return over that, that two years. Now that's obviously if everything delivers, as we expect, but we think that's a great, great sort of timing and, and great return potential 
certainly in the current environment. And that's why we should be looking at international equities, because you have these great businesses that people very often are just ignoring as they chase perhaps the US or the latest fad or, or the AI being the latest. What we focus is on cash flows and assets, and that's how you generate great long-term returns, but also protect capital on the downside. So I will pause there and open it. Open the floor then, Carl. Andrew, that, that is really kind of an exciting way to look at the future when you think about having potentially a 59% uh, upside in a couple of years. It, how does that compare to what you think about over time? Is it higher than usual? Yes, it is. And, and that's we found that a great indication of the subsequent returns. So, you know, when we look at place, times like 2009, 2016, when we see these sort of portfolio returns, that's a great entry point for investors because it, it, we do tend to deliver. And typically, it's probably been more like 35, 40, we'd say, as the, as the return potential. So when we're at these high levels, and again, I would, I would highlight that very often these are, it, well, these tend to be very conservative uh, assumptions and forecasts that we use here. And, you know, you know so when we review, uh, there can be more upside, if you like. Right. But we that's, think that's ample. That's pretty big. That's exciting. Yeah. And I, I see some companies in there that, you know, um, we haven't talked about. I mean, to think about getting, a, you know, a huge return on a company that builds adhesives like Henkel. Um, that's kind of exciting, but there's also a company in there, Alibaba, that's been in the news even today here in America. Yeah, kind of um, scary, maybe. I, I wonder <laughs> about China. I mean, it's a company that's in China, and there's been a lot of political turmoil there. And what, yeah, what are your thoughts about that? And it's got the biggest potential upside. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And to be fair, when I talk about the risk adjusted upside, you see. We need to see that sort of upside for China, given some of those geopolitical issues. But again, this is one where, you know, it's gone from it's halved and halved again, uh, the share price of Alibaba. So it's gone from three years ago, everyone falling over themselves that you had to own China, that you had to own technology in China to now being a pariah that everyone hates it. And. And we we like that. So we didn't own a single share in China until Alibaba, until it, it did this collapse in share price. Uh, and then we think it's interesting when everyone's fleeing an area. We, we want to see if that's unearthed uh, an interesting opportunity. And in some ways, Alibaba is a very low risk share. So it's got just over a $200 billion market valuation today, but it has around half of that in cash and short dated securities. So when you actually look at the, the true valuation of Alibaba, uh, it's trading on uh, like a five times price to earnings ratio for what is ultimately the, the largest e-commerce marketplace, you know, it's in the world. And it's still growing. It has a cloud business similar to Amazon's AWS. That's actually loss making, but it's moving to profit. And one of the things we really like about the business in in a, in that sort of adversity uh, comes good things. So what you've got now is Alibaba is breaking itself up into six different component parts. Uh, each one, when we do ask some of the parts analysis, which is one of the areas we we, we love to do, uh, you can see comparables for each of those different businesses. So they've got one of the largest logistics networks in Asia. Uh, that's going to be listed separately. We think this is a great way of unlocking value uh, from Alibaba. And, and they're also doing a share buyback now. So they've sought permission to, do, to buy back $25 billion of shares in the next two years. And they're incredibly cash generative still. So they're making around 15 to 20 billion per annum in free cash flow, even with these loss making, some of these loss making businesses. So we think there's oodles of value uh, as a term we use in the UK, oodles of value in Alibaba that will be unearthed. Uh, and if the market doesn't realize that, well, the company itself is doing that in, in terms of what it's actually doing. So we actually think it's going to be a great investment for us going forward. And hence that side, side type of return. That's great. And, and to be fair, it's not in the largest holdings. It's a, that 3.8% yeah. that, that I read that right. 
Yes, that's right. Because that's one way of controlling risk as well, to the sizing of the positions. Great. Go ahead. Andrew, question about the, uh, the type of industries that appear to be most promising, because I can look at the list, but I don't recognize exactly what they do or what. Sure. Which ones are the most promising the, and over the trends that you see? East technology, auto, whatever. Yeah, each one's different uh, in terms of the drivers. I mean, but very often what we like is, is businesses in transition. So Siemens, uh, a lot of people still view it as an old industrial business uh, in, in Europe. It was seen as a sort of German industrial, but it's clearly it's a global business today. And one of its biggest drivers is actually software. So it does all automation. It's, it's actually comparable to a Rockwell uh, in the US in terms of the industrial automation it does. Software is driving growth and is, a, is about a third of its automation sales now at Siemens, yet it just doesn't in, enjoy that valuation, anything like a Rockwell uh, or Piers, uh, if you like. So, so each business is different in terms of the trends. And, and I suppose, again, what we look for is we're bottom up. We go where we find that those interesting businesses we're not looking for top-down trends per se but clearly if we can find that within a business if we can find a business that's transitioning into an area of higher growth that's changing the fundamentals then clearly that can be a mispriced asset because actually when expectations are low and the valuations are low if they start to deliver as siemens has uh this year and it was also hit with the Ger with being german uh so we actually bought more you can see there in q3 and again, from that from that purchase price, it's up around fifty percent from when we were adding to the position uh, in in Germany. But each one is different. Fresenius is a a, um, a German healthcare uh, business. Tesco's food retail. Uh, we talked about Mitsubishi Heavy. CK Hutch is an interesting one in that it's it's basically European infrastructure assets, but because it's listed in Hong Kong, it's been caught up, up in the general sell off. Uh, in China, and it's never been as cheap as it is today, that business. But again, we look for signs of change, a catalyst to crystallize that value. value. So they're looking to dispose of their assets in Europe. It's just announced a deal with their telecoms business, three with Vodafone here in the UK, and they're going to take a minority. They're going to lower their ownership of that business, which is all starting to crystallize value that we see as hidden value in that share. Thank you. Andrew, there's a question here asking if you could talk a little bit more about elaborate on your cell decision, cell discipline yes, and uh, East Railway Japan being noted as having a 2% two, 2 upside and kind of yeah. what we see the determinants in selling that. Yeah, great, great question, Kiko, because that's absolutely key for us, given our value discipline. So before we even buy a single share, we have a view of where we will sell that share. So in effect, it's a target price, our view of fair value. And that's typically set two years out using conservative assumptions and conservative valuations. So but clearly over time, the variables can move, the cash flows, the fundamentals can improve with a company company over time. And so we absolutely are always monitoring that and, and constantly updating that. We're very loath to change the valuation method because what you find is you, as something does well, you get more excited, but the variable clearly can move. So East Japan Railway is the, it's a railway business in Tokyo, basically in Japan, but it's also developed, it's a major property owner in the in the Tokyo metropolitan area, it owns hotels because it's developed a lot of, and it owns retail because it's developed a lot of the infrastructure and the real estate around the main stations it, it owned. That was a business again, really hit with COVID because people just didn't travel. So it's typically running about seventy percent of its capacity at the moment uh, in terms of people traveling in the Tokyo area. Now, over the next two years, two to three years, they expect that to get back to 96%, which will drive recovery in that variable. Before we sell a share, though, when it hits that level, we want to review it because we are conservative and things may move. East Japan is one we're actually reviewing right now. And we think there could be more upside here because we're starting to see that recovery come through and the variable move. And so 
So we don't just necessarily knee jerk sell at that point. We want to review it, see if there's more upside because we are conservative and then and then we'll, we'll reevaluate. But the third reason to sell, if you like, is when those fundamentals don't get better uh, or even they deteriorate. So if a business, the fundamentals aren't quite what we thought they were at the outset, maybe they've got worse and we're monitoring it. We call that a thesis violation and that causes us to review it and can lead us to sell. But we but we, we term it our value traps because we want the mindset and our mindset is, our mantra is at a lower price. If everything's the same, we want to be adding more. Uh, we want to be buying that. But you have to control it and you have to manage that. And so we, we, we call it our three bites discipline. And we're very disciplined about doing that because the third thing is it, you, you can just sell. If there's that thesis value, value violation, that can be a reason to sell as well. Got a question, Andrew. Um, I believe one of your slides stated that the portfolio had a heavy overweight to Germany. For our clients that have concerns of the Russia-Ukraine situation escalating even beyond where it's at today, and the fact Germany is so dependent on Russia, uh, how can you provide some confidence to us that this portfolio would hold up in the event that that situation got worse than it is right now? Yeah, sure. Again, a great question, because clearly Germany was the epicenter of risk last year. So I mentioned that 40 percent of its gas came from Russia. What that's meant with the onset of the war, what's that meant that what that has meant is a wholesale switch. Um, so there was a crisis point going into the winter, which meant there was this real sell off in Germany because people were very worried about exactly this point and what it meant for in the industrial base in Germany. Germany then has completely switched uh, its its resources. So it now gets no gas uh, from from Russia, has found alternative sources, has built storage. So it's built offshore storage for gas. So LNG can come. Uh, from from the Middle East, et cetera, and alternative sources. But what would have typically taken three years to do, it's built in six months. So it's now completely weaned itself off Russian gas. And so Mr. Putin used that to squeeze Germany and, and stop it supporting Ukraine. That's gone now as a risk in, a, in effect for Germany. Clearly, we've got a winter to come and there is still some concern, but so that the vast majority now of its supplies now come from elsewhere. And so that risk to some extent ha has gone and it, and it created a, a really great opportunity to buy some of these Russian, uh, some of these German uh, assets because they, they were on fire sale prices, which is exactly what we want to do. Now, some of them have come roaring back. Uh, so we, Siemens was one that we added to that we've now started to reduce our position there because it's done incredibly well. As I said, it was up about 50 percent. Uh, the risk of the war escalating beyond we think is quite it, it's almost reached a stalemate now. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to see it now getting any worse in terms of the risk perspective for investors, because, you know, it's all about the discounting uh, of risk, in, and particularly in the international equity space. These risks get very quickly priced in and, and discounted. And what, what tends to happen is investors overreact, and they overreact to the fear side. I think we mentioned this at the very start, that when fear grips markets, that's what we want to be heading in the other direction, because we think that unearths some great businesses, which ultimately are international global businesses. Siemens has a, about less than 25% of its workforce and assets based in Germany. It's a truly global business uh, com competing with the likes of Rockwell, et cetera. And that's really what we've bought uh, in, the, in some of those uh, instances. Thank you. Any more Andrew, can I ask you a question about Japan? Um, yep. In my in my chair, I talk to a lot of international managers, and Japan is a market that many active managers are chronically underweight. Um, I, this year, it's been a top performer. Um, yep. uh, on the, in the kind of broader equity markets, can you just kind of maybe share your broader thoughts on on Japan? You know, are those changes that they've talked about for years now finally coming through? 
Um, and, you know, obviously you have a handful of names as well, and we've touched some of them, but, um, and obviously it's, it's interesting because it's the biggest country in the, in the index still. Yeah, yeah. No, you're completely right. That uh, This year, suddenly, uh, probably led by Mr. Buffett, but international vest- investors have woken up uh, to, J- to Japan, it seems. But to me, they're sort of coming late to the party in many cases, that many of these stocks in Japan are now at, at new all-time highs. Uh, and we, we've actually reduced, we started to reduce our exposure uh, to Japan in that sort of fill-up that we've seen uh, by international investors. We think the, there are still some opportunities in, in Japan. It's very much a case by case uh, because there is real change. Uh, there's some great companies in terms of technology, asset base. There's some, there's some great balance sheets uh, and cash flows that are available in Japan. But, but they're getting fewer and fewer now as the stock prices have raced ahead. And... And what, what we think is that Europe is now the place to be. So we always want to be ahead of that move, Kiko, because once that's once that's achieved, we, we want to be moving, you know, particularly places like Germany, uh, where they were, they were under this cosh, where, they're, they're, again, really great companies like Henkel that were on offer on, on, on fire sale prices. But, but the international markets across the board look far better than the US in terms of in terms of valuations. But the one thing to know in Japan has been the currency, because part of that sort of appreciation in the stock market, though, has been accompanied by currency weakness. So particularly as a US dollar investor, the returns haven't been so great, given that currency weakness. And that is a particular issue that you have to watch in Japan. That, that brings up a great question. And Kiko, unless you have a follow up. No, please, no go for, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I um, that one of the questions we had before the presentation began was from someone who wanted to know: Does owning international stocks protect against a potential fall on the U.S. dollar? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that, that's definitely a way to view international equities as a as a way of diversification. Clearly, you're accessing different currency streams, and so it absolutely should give you some protection from a, a general fall in the, in the dollar. Uh, but it's diversification in, in in many other ways as well. It's you know whether it's country risk, it's clearly currency, country risk, different businesses. But from our point of view, it's also valuations that you're not playing in these very high valuations that that perhaps are prevalent in the U.S. market. There's these real bargains in the international markets that we think investors really are ignoring. You know, the U.S. has gone to seventy percent of global indices with the passive investing and perhaps ETFs all pushing investors into the same stocks. You know, the the return on the U.S. market has really been driven by a very small number of the large tech companies. And typically, that's not been a healthy environment for long-term returns from there, whereas that's just not the case in international equities. And and there are these great global companies that you can gain access to on low valuations with low expectations. And that, we think, gives you real diversification in, in, in the asset markets today. And that's backed up with that work that I showed from research affiliates in terms of the returns that they're looking at generating. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Mike. And I would add that historically, the dollar weakness has been, the cycle of the dollar has been significantly correlated with international assets outperforming U.S. assets. So if you look over time, as the dollar depreciates, U.S. Equity, our U.S. equities tend to underperform international equities. And, and we have a chart that we've done over time, this I can share with you, Carl, and you can share it with everybody on this call. But there is a very tight correlation between the dollar depreciating and the U.S. Uh, U.S. underperforming internationally. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, send that over. I think I've seen it before, but it'd be great to get an updated version of that. Thanks. So it seems like a lot of things are lining up to be um, uh, overweight international. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of one of our sort of mantras, it's all about what the marginal investor is going to do in, in terms of if the market's a weighing machine, where's that cap, marginal capital flowing? And the US and US tech has sucked so much one way that it's left these other markets where you've got these real bargains. You know, companies with similar or superior fundamentals trading at half, if not lower, the valuation levels. And to us... 
that just has to be the right way to sort of invest to generate those long term returns and and it does feel like actually investors are starting to move on this uh you know we showed some of the the sort of the turn in value uh and this point about that the us would be basically be flat if it wasn't for these tech titans whereas as kiko was mentioning you're really starting to see the turn in japan and europe uh, but this can go on for for quite some time given how extreme we've got uh, with some of those charts we're showing earlier. Yeah, that was a dramatic chart. And, and certainly in our investment history, which at AI is close to 30 years, it looks like this the biggest separation between how much people are willing to overpay for US stocks versus the opportunity yeah. to get great bargains everywhere yeah. else. In the world. I, I don't think it's been bigger. No, absolutely. You know, we've got we've got some charts as more charts we can show you as well, Carl. It all echo that message. It's a consistent message uh, that we're that we're seeing, uh, but it's hard. You know, it's hard for investors to do that. That because it 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 feels like you're going against the tide. But that is exactly what you have to do in investment. We feel to generate those superior returns and protect capital to generate long term capital returns. That's great. Well, if there are any questions from the uh, the Zoom audience, you know, just type it into the chat. We got a one over the Q and A. You can do Q and A or the the chat feature. Um, any questions from our team? I've got one, just final one. It's not quite personal, Andrew, but boy, when we visited um, last year, I was there in person during some strikes, and in the UK was really going through a hard time. And then we had another Zoom maybe a month or two later, and it got worse in the UK. You, you had a prime minister who lasted less than a head of a cabbage, I think was the, <laughs> um, the queen died. Um, yep. I mean, holy cow. Have things gotten better since then? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we sort of always look at the the underlying you know assets and incomes. We look at the court, the companies. Uh, that you're buying, you know, you're buying access to the cash flows, you're buying access to those assets of those companies. And those corporates, in many cases, are global. But you're absolutely right in terms of the UK having a cloud over it, uh, which then depresses those valuations, but gives us the opportunity. Uh, we think, you know, I mentioned Apple now being more than the UK, uh, it, it, which is the third largest, we're still the third largest stock market in the UK, in the world, the, the UK. And it has some great companies. You know, we, we, we've got Tesco uh, there. We've, we've got Lloyd's, which is one of the leading banks uh, in Europe that we own. We've got BT as a telecoms operator. You know, we think, the, but these are on what we would term giveaway prices. BT, you're paying a price to earnings. So the forward earnings is less than seven and it's giving us a yield of greater than 7% from a dividend, which is well covered. Uh, and, and so we think the return potential that you can get from these assets uh, are great. You know, uh, they've listed here the UK on this chart. You can see where it sits uh, in the middle around Europe, but we're stock pickers within that. So we pick these investments uh, within within the UK, but but we like it when we get this cloud uh, because we think it does create this these bargains. Uh, but We've got a king now and things are getting better in the UK, you know, and actually we've been helped with the weakness with the pound actually starts to help the UK recover. I love it. Leave it to the investor from London to like investing in a cloud. <laughs> it's so great to see you again. Thank you so much. Mike and Kiko, thank you for arranging this and, and putting it on for, for our, our little investment firm. Um, thanks to everybody for being here. Um, we've got more events coming up. We've got our open house uh, coming up the 28th. So please come by and uh, and be here for that. And then Chad and I are going to do kind of an investment summary, a, a Q2 wrap up. And Kiko, we're going to use a lot of Kiko's research and the, and the IM Global Partners team research for that. And that's on August uh, 2, I believe. Is my favorite, right? Uh, oh, I flipped it over, over here. It's August 2nd. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. It's just great to have you as part of our investment team. And, and uh, you know, it, it has been easy to own you since we bought you. You've been, our, I think, maybe perhaps our biggest winner since the, we, we, we uh, committed to invest our clients' capital with you. So keep up the good work. Well, glad to deliver and great to see you all. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.